So a question I started getting asked a lot when I started talking about how to do a 3D car was how do you make an AI car that drives around the track? And this car you're looking at right now, uh, I'm not touching it. It's driving on its own and it's not very smart. This was actually something that I made to try and make the, the dumbest possible car that could make it around a track. And to do that, I used an algorithm called context-based steering. And that's what we're going to look at today, how to do this. And this works perfectly well in 2D and in 3D. And it also works for all sorts of things besides just cars going around racetracks. All right, so let's look at how this works. For this demo, we're going to use a generic agent object, which is a kinematic body 2D with a sprite and a cushion shape. And I'm keeping it generic so that you can see how this algorithm works and that it doesn't really matter what type of object you're attaching it to. It can work for uh, a car driving around a track. It could work for a guard patrolling a dungeon. Um, a, any number of different kinds of game objects could use this process. And at the base of the algorithm, what we have is a number of rays. And the agent is going to choose a direction it wants to go in, maybe towards a target, maybe towards a player, maybe towards a goal. And then it's also going to have uh, some of these directions represent danger, maybe obstacles that it needs to avoid, um, other things that it wants to flee away from, whatever. And that's how it develops its context of its environment and how it's going to decide how to steer. So in the agent, we're going to have two arrays, one called interest and one called danger, that are going to represent the magnitude of those vectors in each direction. And so if the interest is high in a particular direction, it wants to go that way. If the danger is high in a particular direction, it does not want to go that way. And combining these two together will be how we determine the final direction to go in. Now, of course, if the interest equally points in all directions, it's kind of boring. It can't figure out where to go. It wants to go everywhere. So we're going to want to have some sort of way of deciding which way that the object wants to go. So for example, we might have this situation where the agent mostly wants to go forward. So the longest vector is pointing directly forward, but it's also okay with going a bit to the left or a bit to the right. But generally, it wants to go forward. So in that situation, the interest array would look like this. The first index is the forward direction, and we go around clockwise. But what if an obstacle appears? So now we have this upward pointing ray is detecting an obstacle. And so we don't want to go that way. So in that case, our interest array would stay the same, but our danger array now has some information in it. And our arrays now look like this. So now we know what our interest is, the direction we want to go, and we know what the danger is, the directions we shouldn't go. And to combine these two, we just go through the danger array, and anywhere we have danger, we eliminate the interest in the matching box. And our resulting direction would be the sum of these two, which is going to make the agent turn to the right and move to go around the obstacle. So to summarize, we have four steps. First, we find interest, which is the directions the object wants to go. Second, we find those directions that have any danger. Those are directions we don't want to go. Step three is we eliminate any interest directions where there was danger. And finally, in step four, we sum up the remaining interest directions, and that tells us what the final direction to move in should be. So let's look at the code for our agent. To begin with, we have our variables. These export variables are going to be the ones where you can configure the behavior, how fast we go, how fast we turn. This is going to be the kind of determine the turning radius. Uh, look ahead is how far ahead are those rays going to project? How far away can we see an obstacle before we reach it? And then I've also got a variable here for the number of rays. Now the example we used before was using eight rays. But of course you can use any number. And there are reasons you might want to use more. There are reasons you might want not to use too many. And we'll talk about what some of those are towards the end of this tutorial, but eight is good enough for us to start with and see how it works. 
And then for our context array, we're going to have our directions that the rays point in. And this is an array. I had curly brackets there for some reason for something before. And then we have our interest array and our danger array like we saw in the example. And then finally we have the chosen direction. That's going to be our result at the end once we've added up the interest, removed the danger, and found the resulting direction. And then velocity and acceleration are going to be our movement properties. So if we scroll down to our ready, we're going to take our three arrays and resize them to the given size. And then we're going to populate the ray directions one with the actual vectors pointing in all those directions, starting with vector two dot right, which points to the right, which is forward for our character, and just going around the circle dividing by however many rays there are. Okay, now in physics process, what we're going to do is we're going to populate the context arrays. And we're going to have functions that do each of those things. Find our interest array, find our danger array, and use those to choose the direction. So we'll get to those in a minute. And then we have our standard movement code, which just takes the desired velocity, the place we want to go, and we interpolate it with the current velocity using our steer force so that we will gradually turn towards the direction we want to go, and we're using move and collide to move. Now the first of the arrays we want to set is interest. And there's a lot of different ways you could do this depending on what your game's setup is. So for this demo, we're assuming that the this agent lives in a world that has a path drawn on it. It has something that the agent's going to need to follow, like a racetrack, right? It's going to want to follow and it's going to want to go around the track in the proper direction, right? We don't want our AI agents driving backwards around the, around the track. So, so we're going to assume that our owner, if we have an owner and the owner has a method called get path direction, it's going to tell us what direction we want to go in. And this way we can stick our agent in any kind of world and let the world tell it what the preferred direction is. This will be the part that you'll do differently depending on your game's setup. So we ask our owner, what's the direction to go in if you're in the position I'm in? right? And it's going to tell us, based on the, the racetrack, which direction we should be going in. And then we take each of the ray directions, each of our rays, and we do a dot product with that path direction. And that dot product is going to give us a result between 0 and 1 how big we want, well actually between negative 1 and 1, but the negative values will be the ones that are pointing in the opposite direction that we want to go. So we're going to zero those out, and we're just going to take either 0 or the value we get. And then I also have this here just in case, which is for just for some of the demos that I did, to set the default interest. And let me put this back to 0 here, which was to just go forward, like in the diagram. Okay, if you don't need this, obviously you would leave this part out of your code. All right, and we'll do an example here in a minute so you can see what that looks like. Okay, but the next function here is the set danger function. And this is where we're going to take each of our rays in our ray directions array and we're going to cast a ray in that direction to see if we hit something. All right, we use the look ahead distance for how far we project forward, and then we're going to set the danger to 1 if we hit something, or 0 if we don't. So there's something there or there isn't something there. And then finally we can choose directions. And we just loop through num rays, and if there's something in danger, we set the interest to 0 there. And we get our chosen direction by just summing up all of the directions where there's interest, and then normalizing it. And now we have a direction that we want to move in. So here's our example again, and I've increased the number of rays to 16 just so that we can see a little more information here. And so if you imagine that to the left is the direction that our world told us that the, the racetrack is going, that's the direction we want to go. So we took our forward direction and we did the dot product with each of the rays. And so you can see that they're getting shorter as we go. Perpendicular rays 
dot product is zero, so we got zero, and any of the rays that were pointing backwards, the dot product would have been negative. So we zeroed those out. So this, these green arrows represent the, the total direction that we want to go. And since there's no danger, none of them are getting eliminated, summing them all up results in a vector pointing forward. But if we add some obstacles here and we see the danger coming in, as the danger changes, you can see our resulting direction is going to be changed as well. If we really want to block it, you can see we're going to turn hard to the right now because there is a lot of danger on the left-hand side. So let's see it in action. We've got a path 2D that I've drawn here to be a track that we're going to follow. And then I've put some static bodies around to give it some obstacles to keep it on the path, right? So we can't, we can't turn in this way, we can't turn out that way. And I've put a whole bunch of agents in here. And all I did to change them was I randomized their speed a little bit so that some of them will be faster and some of them will be slower. And if we look at the code real quick, this get path direction is what all of the agents are going to call to say, hey, what direction do I need to be going? So we're going to find the closest offset along the curve to the position that was given. So the closest point on the curve to where the agent is. We're going to take our path follow 2D node, which is a child of the path 2D, and we're going to set its offset to that position. So now we have that node has moved to that position, and we just take its transform.x, which is its forward direction, and that's what we return. So if you're a path follow on the path, that's what forward is at that point in the path, and that's the direction we want the agents to move in as well. So let's look what it looks like when we run this. Okay, so see, you can see them trying to follow the track. Here's a really fast one, right? And as soon as he finds a way around, he's going to skip past some of these guys. There we go. And so you can see with some simple code, we've got some pretty good path following behavior. And if I turn on debug here, you can see you can see how those interest and danger vectors are changing as they move around. If they get too close to one wall, they're going to want to steer away from it too far, and they'll want to steer back away again. And for the most part, they're going to want to try and go forward along the path. And that's it. This is a pretty flexible and easily adaptable algorithm that you can apply to a lot of different types of objects. Uh, the main things you're going to want to think about when you're configuring this are the look ahead, how far ahead does an obstacle get seen, and a lot of that's going to have to do with how fast you're moving, uh, but also the number of rays. Now the more rays you have, the more the finer detail you're going to to have in detecting smaller objects, for example. But obviously, the more performance hit there's going to be, because you have more and more rays you're having to cast every frame to detect movement. In practice, I have found that 8 is maybe a little too low for some cases, although it works perfectly fine in others. And 16 is probably good enough for most uses. Um, you can go higher and have you know, 32 or 64, and obviously it doesn't even have to be a power of two. But the more that there are, the more um, the more you're going to have to figure out those trade-offs of is it going to be worth it? Am I getting any better behavior? And you can try it. You increase it to, to 32 and you see that they drive around just the same, then maybe 32 wasn't necessary. And as always, if you take a look at the written version of Ron, go to recipes.com. You can see some more detail of how the implementation works and some suggestions down here at the bottom for some other improvements or additions you could make that might give you some different behavior based on what your needs are. And I'd love to hear your feedback on there as well. All right. Hopefully you found this algorithm interesting and useful and can apply it to your own games, not just racing games like this one, but any other kind of AI that you need some kind of steering behavior on. Let me know in the comments below if you tried it out and got it working in your game. I'd love to see what you got it to do as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. 
You can find this recipe and lots more on the Godot Recipes website at godotrecipes.com. Here you can find a wide variety of recipes for creating the game system you need, some help on how to get started with Godot in the basics section, and lots more. I recommend you go over there and explore and let me know if there's something you're looking for that you'd like me to add as I'm always adding more recipes over time. Right, thanks for watching and I'll see you in a future video.